On behalf of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Administration for Community Living, and the Indian Health Service, I would like to welcome everyone to the Long-Term Services and Support Webinar Series. My name is Amanda Ree Fox, and I work for Kaufman and Associates. I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Today's webinar is Emergency Preparedness in Indian Country. Before we begin, I would like to highlight the main features of your webinar interface. First is the main window where you see your PowerPoint slides to the left of your screen. To the bottom right of the window is the Q&A pod. You can enter a question for our presenters at any time in the Q&A pod. A Q&A session will take place after the presentation. If you need technical assistance during the webinar, please enter your tech support question in the Q&A pod. Our tech support staff will be monitoring these questions throughout the webinar and will work to answer your tech support questions right away. You will receive an answer in the Q&A pod. Finally, please be aware that today's webinar is being recorded and that re the recording will be made available online in the near future on cms.gov. Please note this webinar series is supported by a contract awarded by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The opinions, findings, conclusions, and recommendations expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily represent the office, official position, or policies of the Department of Health and Human Services or the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Our presenter today is Rhonda Schwartz. She is the Regional Administrator from Region 3 for the Administration for Community Living with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I will now turn it over to Ms. Schwartz to introduce today's topic. Thank you very much, Amanda Ray, and I'm very happy to be with you all today, and I thank you for joining me. Again, my name is Rhonda Schwartz, and I am the Regional Administrator for the Administration for Community Living covering the mid-Atlantic region states of the District of Columbia, Delaware, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and West Virginia. The Administration for Community Living is a federal agency that promotes support and services for older adults and people with disabilities of all ages. I've been with ACL for about three and a half years, and prior to that, I spent more than seven years at a state agency that focused on aging. I have partnered with the Region 2 Office of FEMA on Emergency Preparedness Workshops, and I have a strong interest in this area. I do have, oops, get the slide there. And uh, there we go. I need to take care of a bit of housekeeping before we begin, and again, similar to what you just heard from Amanda Ray, the opinions expressed in this presentation are my own. They do not reflect the views of the Administration for Community Living, the Department of Health and Human Services, or the United States government. Just to show you what our agenda will cover today, first we will talk about a need for planning, then we will talk about resources and tools that are available, particularly focused on Indian Country. We will look at special considerations for older adults. They tend to be disproportionately affected by disasters, as I'll discuss in more detail later. And then we will also look at some caregiver and older adult preparedness resources and tools. First, I want to take a look at the need. Uh, the slide that you see here is a map that was created by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I will refer to this agency throughout these first few slides as NOAA. And according to NOAA, since 1980, the United States has had over 203 or has had 203 weather and climate disasters where the overall damage cost reached or exceeded $1 billion. That's per disaster. The cumulative cost for these 203 disaster offense exceed $1 trillion. In 2016, there were 15 weather and climate events with losses exceeding $1 billion each. 
These 15 events led to 138 fatalities and caused $46 billion in total direct costs. And this map shows where those disasters in 2016 took place. As you can see, of course, it's um, in various places in the country. This next map, also prepared by NOAA, shows where the billion-dollar events uh, took place during 2017. Um, events are happening in some different parts of the country than were shown on the 2016 map. All parts of the country have some vulnerability to some type of natural disaster, whether it's severe weather, earthquake, wildfire, et cetera. According to the NOAA, during 2017, we experienced an historic year of weather and climate disasters. In total, we had 16 separate billion-dollar disaster events that year, including three tropical cyclones, eight severe storms, two inland floods, a crop freeze, drought, and wildfire. And again, um, this map shows where those events took place. Again, you see it's pretty much throughout the in different parts of the country. During 2018, the U.S. experienced another active year of weather and climate disasters. Again, for the NOAA, we were impacted by 14 separate billion-dollar disaster events during 2018. These included two tropical cyclones, eight severe storms, two winter storms, drought, and wildfires. According to NOAA, the past three years, 2016 through 2018, have been historic, with the average annual number of billion-dollar disasters being more than double the long-term average. The number and cost of disasters are increasing over time, and again, according to NOAA, this is due to a combination of increased exposure, vulnerability, and the fact that climate change is increasing the frequency of some types of extremes that lead to these kinds of disasters. And again, this map on this slide shows where those events were during 2018. Unfortunately, there are other causes of emergencies that give rise to a need for preparedness. Intentional acts include such things as domestic or international terrorism, active shooter incidents, et cetera. Unfortunately, this is a fact of life today. Utility outages. These often happen due to a weather event. However, these may not be the result of a particular weather event. For example, look at the California rolling power outages that are taking place now. These outages are an example of something happening that we may not necessarily have been able to anticipate. It shows why well we need to take an all-hazards approach to emergency planning. Accidents, and in particular involving hazardous materials, could happen at any time. For example, there could be an accident at a chemical plant or a truck car carrying hazardous materials might overturn. And then, of course, we from time to time might have a public health emergency, such as a disease outbreak or an epidemic. In addition, there are special considerations that tribal communities should take into account. For example, reservation lands may be isolated, Cell phones may not work on reservation lands in the event of an emergency. Access to roads or transportation may be a concern. Emergency shelters may not be located nearby. And there may be a need to protect livestock. The good news is there are resources available to assist tribal organizations with planning for emergency situations. A good place to start is with the Federal Emergency Management Agency, which you may know of as FEMA. FEMA offers several trainings that are aimed at tribal organizations. They are offered through their Emergency Management Institute. The audience are selected tribal, are, are, are tribal elected officials, tribal council members, presidents, governors, appointed officials, tribal government, department heads. There are no fees or materials costs for these courses, and depending on the course offered, while travel may be required to their campus in Maryland, housing and reimbursement for travel may be available. So I recommend that you contact FEMA for more information. 
now going to take a look at some of the courses that are offered. First, I want to touch on the Emergency Management Overview for Tribal Leaders. The purpose of this course is to give leaders an understanding of emergency management principles and practices in order to protect tribal citizens' lands and culture. This is a four-hour overview course. This course can be offered in the field, and there is no need to travel to EMI to take this course. The next course I would like to mention is uh, Continuity of Operations for Tribal Governments. The purpose of this is to give tribal governments the foundation to ensure that their operation of essential functions can continue during emergency events. This is a two-day course. Continuity of operations planning is highly recommended for all entities, whether it's government, business, nonprofit, to make sure the entity can continue to perform essential functions during an emergency and to restart operations as soon as possible following an emergency. Another course that is offered is called the Emergency Operations for Tribal Governments. The purpose here is to assist tribal officials in developing organizational, organizational structures, procedures, and resources in order to have effective emergency operations. This is a more intense four-day course. The next course and the last course I want to mention is called Mitigation for Tribal Governments. The purpose of this course is to give tribal governments a foundation to help them to reduce or prevent losses from natural or other hazards. Again, this is another four-day um, intensive course. FEMA also offers online training courses, so I recommend that you contact FEMA for more information. I want to touch upon some other FEMA resources that you may not be aware of. FEMA has tribal liaisons assigned to each region. They are your first point of contact in the region. You can find them at this website that I'm showing on the slide, www.fema.gov forward slash tribal hyphen contact. FEMA tribal liaisons help build relationships with tribes in their regional area, helping them to understand and to use FEMA's programs, especially during times of disaster. It is a good idea to get to know your tribal liaison. Some other FEMA resources that I would like to mention. Ready Indian Country is a web page that FEMA has developed. It contains information specific to Indian Country. For example, it will show which types of kinds of natural disasters can be expected to happen in different parts of Indian Country. It also includes brochures and posters that are designed for different regions of the United States. The Preparedness Resources for Tribes, this is a, pay, a web page that includes links to training, grant opportunities, and planning resources. The FEMA Emergency Operations Plan Guide, which is also shown here, this guide provides guidance on the fundamentals of planning and development of emergency operations plans. This is not aimed at tribes specifically, but you could find it to be very helpful. The next resource I would like to mention is the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which I'm guessing you all are familiar um, with this agency. The Bureau of Indian Affairs supports tribal preparedness efforts by providing technical assistance in acquiring training and exercise resources that can contribute to the tribe's preparedness and resiliency initiatives. The Bureau of Indian Affairs has an emergency management division, and it can assist tribes in acquiring equipment, equipment and other resources that can increase the capacity and capability of a tribe to respond to disasters. So that is another good place to reach out to. I also want to focus on some grants that are available to assist you in planning for and responding to disasters. The first grant I would like to mention is the Department of Homeland 
Security Tribal Homeland Security Grant Program. This grant provides funding to tribes to strengthen their capacity to prevent, protect against, respond to, and recover from potential terrorist attacks and other hazards. It includes planning, continuity of operations, training exercises, and community preparedness programs, such as community emergency response teams, which I'm going to touch upon a bit later. 2020 funding for this grant has not yet been announced, and for most of the grants, or all the grants that I'm going to touch upon today, because the budget has not been finalized for 2020, these grants may not be uh, showing up as available yet on the respective websites. They require congressional appropriation, but be on the lookout for them um, throughout the year. The next grant um, to mention is the Department of Homeland Security Emergency Management Performance Grant Program. The purpose of this program is to provide federal funds to states to assist in state, local, territorial, and tribal government pre preparation for all hazards. Through the program, the federal government provides direction, coordination, and guidance, and provides assistance to support an all hazards emergency preparedness system. The funds under these grants go to the state. It's a good idea to reach out to your state to see if you can be included in one of these grant programs. FEMA also has a grant called the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. This program helps communities implement hazard mitigation measures after a presidential major disaster declaration. The purpose is to enact measures that will reduce the risk of loss of life and property from future disasters. Among other things, um, a, a disaster declaration request has to be submitted within 30 days of the incident to qualify for this program. So again, this grant comes into play after an emergency has occurred, and the purpose is to help mitigate, minimize the loss, the loss from future emergency events. The Administration for Native Americans, which is located within the Administration for Children and Families, also issues grants, and they have issued grants whose funds have been used for emergency preparedness activities by grantees. In particular, I'm looking, talking about the Social and Economic Development Strategies grants that have been issued. I recommend that you check ANA's website for this next grant opportunity for this program and for other possible grant opportunities. The last grant I want to mention is a grant from my own agency. This is uh, disaster assistance for state units on aging and for tribal organizations. This funding is available for Older Americans Act grantees. So each state will have a state aging agency, which is a designated state unit on aging, that will be a grantee under the Older Americans Act. In addition, under the Older Americans Act, we have funding for federally recognized tribes. The tribes have to apply for these funds in order to be grantees. If you are an Older Americans Act grantee, whether as a state unit on aging or as a tribal grantee, if you do have a disaster, this funding may be available for you. So it's for major disaster areas as, as declared by the president. Again, as I mentioned, for a tribe to qualify, they would have to be federally recognized and must be a current Title VI grantee under the Older Americans Act. You can see the um, link there to where you can find the most recent posting for our current disaster assistance grant. The examples of the types of costs that this grant has covered are perhaps overtime costs for staff that are incurred due to an emergency. We also have covered funds to cover replacement of lost food for an Older Americans Act meals program. We also have covered um, an, a temporary increase in meal costs that were incurred due to a closure of a caterer for one of our Older Americans Act meal programs. Um, these, these grants also have been used to cover the cost to replace kitchen equipment at our um, Older Americans Act meal site. Just to give you an idea of the kinds of things we have covered 
again, these funds only can be used um, in areas that have been declared a major disaster area by the president. There are some other planning tools that I want to make you aware of that could be useful elements of your emergency management preparedness planning. Uh, the first is a disaster declaration. Federally recognized tribal organizations may request a presidential emergency or disaster declaration independently of the state. Before the law was changed in 2013, a tribe had to go through the governor of the state in which it was located in order to apply for federal disaster relief. That option remains to tribes who, for whatever reason, do not want to use FEMA's new direct authority to work directly with tribes. But now, as I said, tribes can request the presidential disaster de declaration um, independently of a state. Terms and conditions apply to these requests. And so I recommend that you see FEMA's tribal declaration guidance or contact your FEMA liaison for more information. Another tool that could be useful is something called a mutual aid agreement. These are agreements between agencies, organizations, jurisdictions. They provide a mechanism to quickly obtain emergency assistance, whether it's in the form of personnel, equipment, materials, or other services. The purpose is to facilitate a rapid short-term deployment of emergency support, either just prior to, during, or after an incident. FEMA has a guideline for mutual aid agreements. You see it here at the bottom of the slide. It's the National Incident Management System Guideline for Mutual Aid. Now, mutual aid agreements typically address the circumstances under which aid may be requested and how the request is to be made. Assistance may be either optional or it may be required to be provided. It's up to the parties and whatever they negotiate. The agreements may provide for trainings and exercises. They will address how costs are to be reimbursed by the party requesting assistance. They typically will talk about the duration of the response and who's going to control the response. They will address such areas as liability, uh, requirements for insurance. They'll address sovereign immunity. The whole idea behind these agreements is that everything is addressed in advance. All that has to happen is for the request to be, to be made and then assistance quickly can be provided. I would like to talk next about a program offered by the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, also known as ASPO. ASPO is located in the Department of Health and Human Services. ASPO, in turn, runs an Office of Emergency Management, which supports state and local partners when requested, prepares the nation's health care system, and connects people to real-time public health and medical emergency information. One of the ASPO Office of Emergency Management programs is the Medical Reserve Corps. The Medical Reserve Corps is a national network of volunteers. It's organized at the local level to improve health and safety within local communities. The Medical Reserve Corps network comprises nearly 1,000 community-based units and almost 200,000 volunteers located throughout the United States and its territories. Medical Reserve Corps volunteers include medical and public health professionals, as well as other community members without health care backgrounds. You don't have to have a health care background to become a Medical Reserve Corps volunteer. The Medical Reserve Corps program supports the network of Medical Reserve Corps units by providing technical assistance, coordination, communications, strategy and policy development, and training and other associated services that also can help communities establish and maintain MRC units in their communities. And this slide shows um, one of the pages of the Medical Reserve Corps section of the uh, ASPA website. Um, if you go to this section of the ASPA website, you can locate MRC units that are near you. 
organizations can partner with the local med medical reserve corps unit on training, public health initiatives, et cetera. You also can form a medical reserve corps unit and tribes can form their own unit. This slide actually shows a portion of Washington State where there are a couple of medical reserve corps units that are tribal units. There also are, as I mentioned uh, a couple slides ago, something called a Community Emergency Response Team, also known as the CERT. There are more than 2,700 local CERT teams nationwide, with more than 600,000 individuals trained since CERT became a national program. FEMA's Community Emergency Response Team program trains volunteers to prepare for the types of disasters that their community may face. And through hands-on practice and exercises, CERT members learn how to safely respond to natural disasters, how to help organize disaster response, and promote preparedness by hosting and participating in community events. Again, you can go to this page um, on the CERT web program website to find a local CERT near you. And as you see here on the slide, I put in a zip code in Washington State and I pulled up, you can see there's a tribal um, CERT program that pops up on this slide. So again, tribes can form their own CERT teams. I also want to mention healthcare coalitions. These are groups of individual healthcare and response organizations such as hospitals, and maybe emergency responders, uh, public health agencies. There are groups of agencies that, that work in a defi defined geographic area to prepare for and to respond to disasters and other emergencies. The Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response has a hospital preparedness program that provides funding for healthcare coalitions. And you can find the healthcare coalition in your area by going to this website. I want to switch gears now and focus a bit on older adults. ACLs, or the Administration for Community Living, I should say, our mission is to maximize the independence, well-being, and health of older adults, people with disabilities across the lifespan, and their families and caregivers. Older adults are disproportionately affected by disasters. More and more community living older adults are living alone. They may have complex health issues, they may be frail, family members may not be nearby. All of these factors contribute to this problem. For example, it was reported that the majority of the victims of the 2017 California wildfires were over age 70. In addition, according to the Centers for Disease Control, more than 70% of the people who died due to Hurricane Katrina were elderly, while people 60 and older only accounted for 15% of the population. And I'd like to draw your attention to the photo that is on this slide. This is a photo taken at a nursing home in Texas during Hurricane Harvey. As you can see, the residents are sitting in quite deep water at the nursing home. Uh, apparently, it was taken by someone there, of course, um, and it was posted on Twitter. And it was posted after emergency responders told the people running the nursing home to stay put in response to the nursing home's request for assistance. Now, I don't know why the decision was made by the nursing home not to evacuate the res residents ahead of the storm or, or what was going on, but this is where they were, um, and they had apparently no plan for um, evacuating the residents. After the photo was posted on Twitter, it quickly went viral, which led to assistance in evacuating the facility. But this incident is showing um, that resources of first responders are limited. We all need to do what we can on a local and individual level to prepare for emergencies. I want to talk a bit about Puerto Rico. Um, as you know, we had Hurricane Maria happen in Puerto Rico during 2017. This chart 
um, was from the New York Times. It shows the percentage increase in the number of deaths after the hurricane in Puerto Rico in 2017 due to this list of causes compared to the average of the previous two years during that time period. As you can see, there was a very large increase in death due to these causes right after the hurricane then took place due to those causes during the previous two years. This slide shows the effects that disasters can have on older adults beyond the direct damage caused. So here, as I'm noting on the slide, during October and November 2017, there were more than 5,500 reports of elder abuse in Puerto Rico. This is almost half the number of reports that were made for the entire previous calendar year. I'm just going to say that again because it's an incredible statistic. So during two months, Right after the hurricane in 2017, they had almost half the total number of reports that they had received for the uh, previous year. This slide breaks down the types of abuse reported to have taken place. Um, as you can see, financial exploitation, neglect, and emotional abuse were the top um, causes that were alleged. The Administration for Community Living has a voluntary national reporting system for adult protective service programs. The system collects adult protective service data that is submitted voluntarily by the state. The data on this slide is similar to what we might typically find in our system in that financial exploitation and neglect tend to have higher reporting rates. The major difference I see here is in the area of self-neglect we often see more self-neglect case reports than other types of maltreatment. This slide further breaks down the data by alleged perpetrator. The ratios here are a little different than what we see at uh, the Administration for Community Living for the voluntary adult protective service data reported to us by the state. Here, children as the alleged perpetrators represent a larger portion of alleged relative perpetrators than we generally see. As you can see, a significant portion of the alleged perpetrators were the children. Because of this disproportionate effect of disasters on older adults, I want to focus a bit now on preparedness for older adults. So, of course, events may happen without warning. The caregiver may be separated from the older adult when the event happens and cannot reach the older adult. Of course, as you typically see, utilities are likely to be interrupted. And again, official assistance may be delayed. I think there tends to be um, an assumption on the part of people sometimes that if something happens, they can just call 911 and get help immediately in an emergency. And people need to understand that that is not necessarily the case, and resources are limited or, and are going to be stretched thin after an emergency. So it's important for us all to prepare at the local level and the individual level as best we can. There are important basic elements of preparedness. This information on this slide is from the FEMA brochure called Preparing Makes Sense for Older Americans, Get Ready Now. This brochure contains important information to pass on to elder tribal members and their families. Being informed means stay informed about what might happen and know what types of emergencies are likely to affect your region so that you can prepare for them. The kit, the emergency supplies kit, the first step is to consider how the emergency might affect the elder's individual needs. It should be planned to be for that individual for a period of time. The standard has been at least three days, but lately I've been hearing that one should really be planning for more like seven days. It is possible that an older adult and their caregivers will not have access to a medical facility or even to a drugstore. It is crucial 
that families think about what kinds of resources they use on a daily basis and what they might do if those resources are limited or not available. The brochure provides a list of suggested supplies for a kit, such as one gallon of water per person per day, um, food supply in non-perishable containers and um, a can opener, um, battery-powered radio, first aid kit, etc. And when it comes to a plan, the brochure provides planning tips regarding such things as having a communications plan, what to do about pets, deciding whether to evacuate. These are some of the basic questions that a caregiver should ask before making a plan for their loved one. What assistance might the older adult need? What can she do for herself? What resources does she have? And very important, can the older adult evacuate in the event of an emergency? Here are some additional questions to consider. Does the older adult use any special equipment, such as a shower chair, special eating utensils, or other equipment? How will the older adult continue to use that equipment that runs on electricity? Do they have a backup power supply? How long will it last? Do they need a specially equipped vehicle or accessible transportation? Are they going to be able to evacuate if that becomes necessary? Do they need help getting supplies? What if the caregiver can't reach them? And how will the older adult arrange for care for her service animal or pet? The pet issue should not be discounted. Many shelters will not accept pets at all or only with proof of certain vaccines. Some only allow service animals as opposed to emotional support animals. Does the elder have the appropriate licenses for her service animal so she will be permitted to keep it with her if she needs to use an emergency public shelter? It is important to have a plan for pets. Often an older adult will not evacuate due to a fear of leaving a pet behind. Some other tips I just want to mention for caregivers and older adults. It's important to understand the risks that the community is likely to face and plan for those risks. If there happens to be a local special needs emergency registry, um, it could be helpful to register for that. Note that those registries may require annual registration. Notify the utility company that serves your area of any special needs for power for medical equipment. Get to know your loved one's neighbors. Um, that can be very important to be able to reach out to a neighbor if you're trying to get help for your loved one. Of course, keep portable cell phone charges on hand so that you can make sure you can use your cell phone. Arrange for a backup in case the primary caregiver isn't available. Sign up to receive official communications in an emergency. Some areas have apps that you can sign up for so you can get notifications on your cell phone. And keep half, at least half a tank of gas in the car and some cash on hand if you can. In an emergency, you may not be able to fill up your car and you may not be able to get uh, cash out of the bank. The Administration for Community Living funds a resource center called the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center. The goals of this resource center include providing expert technical assistance to grantees as well as making information and resources available to the community generally. This resource center developed a toolkit called the Disaster Planning Toolkit for People Living with Dementia. This toolkit helps people living with dementia, their family members, and their caregivers understand what to expect in the event of a disaster and how to prepare for it. I have to tell you, I've looked through this toolkit myself, of course, and personally, I think it's a good toolkit for older adults generally and not just for folks living with dementia. The toolkit includes seven tip sheets and checklists for people living with dementia, their families, and others. It also covers the following areas planning for a disaster, important contacts, emergency supplies checklist, 
my medical conditions and care needs, disaster planning tips for people living alone with dementia, planning for after a disaster, and tips for communication and responding to dementia, system, dementia symptoms. For example, providing communication tips for caregivers, the toolkit points out that an interruption in routine for a person with dementia can be very unnerving. The toolkit provides tips for caregivers for communicating with an individual who has dementia, such as talking in a place that is quiet, speaking slowly and clearly, using a warm and easygoing tone, and providing reassurance that you are there to help the person. The toolkit also points out that emergency supplies for a person with dementia may be different from what we might think of as standard emergency supplies, such as an ID bracelet, items that provide comfort to the person, such as a favorite blanket or pillow, games or puzzles they like to do, and music that they like. The toolkit also provides tips for how to plan if the person will stay in place during a disaster and tips for what to do if the person will evacuate. I want to finish with this slide that just shows you a few governmental resources um, to help you with preparedness for caregivers and for older adults. Again, that brochure I mentioned, Preparing Makes Sense for Older Americans, Get Ready Now. Uh, by FEMA is available at the ready.gov website. There are some other good tips here um, in the information provided on this slide. And I think we are ready to go ahead and take any questions that people may have. This is our time for questions. Please enter your questions in the Q&A pod located at the bottom right side of your screen. a question and the brochures are available free of charge. If you go to um, the ready.gov website, when I say free of charge, you can download them, but I'm not sure if you can order them, but you certainly can download them and print them out. Are there any more questions? Okay, I would like to thank Ms. Schwartz for joining us today and sharing information about emergency preparedness resources. In closing, I would like to remind everyone that today's webinar was recorded and the audio presentation slides will be made available online at cms.gov on the Tribal LTSS Technical Assistance Center website. Thank you again for joining us today. Our session is now concluded.